The New Orleans Saints open up some much needed cap space, sign their rookie draft class and meet with the media. It's a big and action packed episode on today's Locked On Saints. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome in to this Wednesday episode of Locked On Saints, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And whether you're listening on your favorite podcast provider or watching on YouTube, don't forget that we're here with you every single Monday through Friday, five days a week, covering your New Orleans Saints. And today's episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Stat Hero, the first ever fantasy sports book that gives you the player the advantage. Check them out at stathero.com slash locked on and get 300% back on your first play. On today's episode, we're going to talk a bit about the Saints beginning to sign their draft class, which should become official later on today. In order to do so, they restructured Marshawn Lattimore's fifth year option. So we're going to talk about how that worked, how much money that saved, and what this means for Marshawn Lattimore's future extension conversations down the road. Then for our midweek fundamentals, instead of looking at defensive assignments, we're going to break down vet minimum salaries and vet salary benefits as well. Why both of them are so important, not only to players, but also teams around the NFL. And then we're going to wrap up with some news and notes from media availability on Tuesday, including what, where Cesar Ruiz is playing right now, what new thing we learned about Zach Bond that's really important, and how the differences between Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill offenses might be handled. As always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, co-managing editor over at CanalStreetChronicles.com, your Tuesday co-host over at the National Locked On NFL podcast. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked On Saints, your team every day. All right, so let's open up with the rookie draft class being signed, and we'll talk about how the Saints figured out how to do that. Because remember, as we were talking in yesterday's episode about the potential signing of Dre Kirkpatrick, who came in for a visit on Tuesday with the New Orleans Saints, no update on any status of a signing or anything like that for him at this time, at least. We'll see if anything pops up later. But the Saints were able to sign that rookie draft class, despite the fact that they had only 348000 or so dollars of salary cap space available. Now, There are two things we should clarify here. First of all, the only players that signed their rookie uh, deals on Tuesday so far were Peyton Turner, Pete Werner, so your first two selections, and then Ian Book and Landon Young. So far, Paul Sinadibo and Kawan Baker have not yet signed their deals, but not because there's anything wrong. Simply, according to Nick Underhill, they were just in meetings, and so they didn't get an opportunity to put pen to paper in time for the NFL transaction wire yesterday. So we should see the rest of those signings, those other two signings become official on the NFL's transaction wire today. So the question still bears, the second question here, and probably the most important one, is how did the New Orleans Saints pull this off? Well, came with a little bit of help from Marshawn Lattimore's contract, which the New Orleans Saints restructured. So basically what the Saints did here is that they took Marshawn Lattimore's $10.2 million base salary converted about $9.2 million of that into a signing bonus, and then spread it out over a presently unknown number of void years as a signing bonus. Remember, signing bonuses can be spread out in terms of how they hit your books financially over the course of a maximum of five years. So at max, the Saints would have taken that, had the 2021 season, and then added four voidable years on that to expand that signing bonus out over five seasons about $1.85 million per season at that rate. That would mean that the Saints would then only be on the hook for just over $2 million when it comes to uh, Marshall and Lattimore's salary, right around two point, right around $2.7, $2.8 million, somewhere around there, effectively freeing up $7.4-ish million in 2021. So they would be on the hook for the new base salary, which is $990,000, we know that for sure. And then whatever the prorated amount of the signing bonus is. No matter what, Marshall and Lattimore just got paid over $9 million up front, basically. And then the Saints are just able to spread this salary cap hit out over the next up to four years after 2021. 
Now, we don't know if it was a maximum restructure at this time, but if it was, we know that it saved them over $7 million. It probably costs around $2.4, $2.5 million to sign the rookies and to get all of the, the rookie contracts done. So you're looking at there probably being somewhere around $5 million left of cap space for the New Orleans Saints all of a sudden. They could use that to sign a guy like Drake Kirkpatrick to a deal as well as maybe work out some other deals with other players. They could use that to maybe go out and pursue a larger signing or even potentially a trade like we discussed yesterday, or they could just hold on to it. Honestly, they could hold on to it, see if they need it. And if they don't, then they end up transferring it over to next season where they're already basically over the salary cap with less than 40 players signed to the roster at this time for the 2022 year. So they have a lot of options in terms of what they can do with that money. What this means for Marshawn Lattimore, however, is a bit unclear at this moment. The New Orleans Saints did the same thing with Sheldon Rankins. They converted his fifth year option, added void years onto his contract and freed up some salary cap space, but they didn't extend him later on. So this doesn't necessarily guarantee that the Saints will extend Marshawn Lattimore, nor does it guarantee that he is not going to be extended at some point. The way that he looks at it is that everything that happened over the offseason has no bearing on what effectively goes on with the extension. He's perfectly fine basically going out there and having to prove himself. And he seems pretty ready to do that based on what he told us in media availability yesterday. So I don't think Marshall Lattimore is worried about his money at this point. In fact, he just got over $9 million up front right now anyway. So he's probably pretty Gucci at this point. But that's the way that this all worked out. Save the Saints some money. It was great to be able to see all of that happen. And of course, get the rookie signings done. And now the Saints have a little bit of money to play with or save and stockpile moving into the rest of the off season. Now coming up next, We're going to talk a little bit more about vet minimum salaries and vet minimum benefits, what they mean for teams and how they help players as well. We'll have that coming up for you as we continue on with another episode of Locked on Saints. And today's episode, as we mentioned earlier, is brought to you by our good friends over at Stat Hero because look, look at me, come here, come close if you're watching on YouTube, listen closely if you're listening on the podcast. You deserve better than the daily fantasy games that you're playing right now. You deserve better. And you know what is better? Stat Hero. Let me tell you a little bit more about Stat Hero and the way that this works out. First of all, it's the first ever daily fantasy sports book that puts the player in control and within winning reach. All right. Only about 15% of players on those other daily fantasy sports apps actually win. It's kind of rigged against you. Stat Hero is not that way. In fact, Stat Hero does something pretty cool. They basically show you the lineups because it's you versus the house ahead of time so that you can make sure that you're building the best team. I started using it. They're doing it right now for the NBA playoffs. I was able to use it. And the thing that I love about it is that it feels like you're just playing fantasy sports, but you're doing it while being able to rotate your lineup every day because I can see the lineup that I want to go up against. I can see the projected points and I can make sure that I build my lineup to compete specifically across the way to the lineup that Stat Hero provides. And it gives me a real opportunity to be able to win ahead of time. It makes me feel like I'm actually a little bit more in control and can play a little bit more strategy than the folks that just have a bunch of tools that I don't have. So don't forget, you're in control when it comes to Stat Hero. It's DFS the way that it was meant to be one on one. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how you can take advantage of a really special offer here. Go to stathero.com slash locked on and you're gonna be able to sign up for free And right now, you can get three times your money back when it comes to your first play, right? So they're giving you 300%, right? A 300% match right away. That's unheard of. Go to stathero.com slash locked on. That's stathero.com slash locked on. And don't forget to check out our good friends over at BuiltBar.com, the best tasting protein bars on the market. Nine delicious flavors, even more deliciouser than they ever were before as well as rotating limited edition flavors that you can catch over on the website all the time as well. Here are some of those great flavors, coconut, coconut, almond, cherry, cherry, barcia, double coconut, excuse me, double chocolate. I would love double coconut. That might be on the way as a limited edition flavor sometime. Salted caramel and mint brownie, of course, my absolute favorite. So go and check them out because there's something for everyone on the website. And every one of these bars is covered in 100% chocolate. But despite that, still only four or five grams of sugar versus 17 or 18 grams of protein, high in fiber, all the things you need to get through your day in one built bar. And these are protein bars that taste like a candy bar. So you get to indulge in something delicious at the same time. So go and check them out at builtbar.com. And don't forget to use the promo code LOCKED1515, use the numerals so that you can make sure you get 15% off of your purchase. That's LOCKED15 for 15% off at builtbar.com. 
All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thank you again so much for being here. And as we turn the corner to our second segment here in today's episode, I want to remind you of the Locked on Pelicans podcast hosted by Jake Madison and the Locked on LSU podcast hosted by Matt Moscona, also here on the network. So if you're fans of either one of those teams here in Louisiana, go and check out my fellow Louisiana Locked on host. Matt over with Locked on LSU, who continue to advance and just will not let Paul Maneri retire. And then, of course, Jake over at Locked on Pelicans, who look to get lucky in the lottery again as the NFL, excuse me, the NBA lottery rolls along. Now, we're going to jump back to the NFL here and continue talking New Orleans Saints. And for our midweek fundamentals this week, we're going to sort of break the trend a little bit. We've mostly been talking about on-field stuff. Let's talk a little bit about some front office dealings and get into some uh, vet minimum salary cap hits, as well as vet minimum benefits. We'll talk about and define both of those, but to help us, we have a little bit of a visual aid over on the YouTube side, but if you're listening, don't worry, we're going to talk through it as well. So what we're looking at or what we're talking about here is going to be the vet minimum salary minimums, basically, and how much a player can get. Remember that these are minimums, which means that a player or an agent can negotiate above these but no team can sign a player with a certain term of service, i.e. how many years they played in the NFL, to a contract lower than what correlates based upon the collective bargaining agreement or the CBA. So this graph here over on the YouTube side is uh, presented by SpotRack. They've broken this down as well. So if you want to look at that, you can see that over at SpotRack as we discuss this. But when it comes down to veteran benefits or veteran salaries, there's a minimum here that adjust and gets and goes basically higher, right? Gets greater based on the years of service that the player has played in the NFL, how many years the player has played. So if you have no NFL experience and you're an undrafted rookie being signed late, or you're a late round rookie that got cut after, let's say the preseason and you get signed by a team that way, then the absolute floor in 2021 is $660,000. That total goes up with every year of experience you have. $660,000 without any NFL experience. After a year, it goes up to $780,000. After another year, in terms of two years, it goes to $850,000. This is a number to remember. Two years of NFL experience means $850,000. We're going to come back to this number when we talk about the veteran minimum salary benefit because this number is huge in that equation. Then it goes up again with three years, and then you get into a couple of ranges. Between four to six years, you have a range, and then seven or above, period, between eight to 16 years of experience, seven or above, then you end up with a $1.075 million salary minimum. So trying to think about a Saints player that signed this. Oh, Ty Montgomery. When Ty Montgomery re-signed with the New Orleans Saints, He took a $1.075 million vet minimum deal. That is the vet minimum. Could have negotiated above that, but again, a little bit tough this season. And especially when you're coming in as somebody that's been with the team before, only had carries in a game, you know, all those things, all of that factors in. So 1.075 is the top notch when it comes to veteran minimum salaries. There's another number here that you would have just heard that we just talked about with Marshawn Lattimore, which is 990,000. That is the minimum between four to six years. He's got four years of experience going into his fifth year. That's why when they reduce his salary, his base salary from that $10.2 million signing bonus, they took it down to $990,000. That's where that number came from. It wasn't just a random number that got made up. It's a part of the CBA and the collective bargaining agreement. Now, that's the way that vet minimum salaries work, right? Depending on how many years you've spent in the NFL, there's a scale that tells you what your minimum is. You can sign for that minimum or you can sign above that minimum. Now, here's where things get a little spicy. If you are a player in the NFL that has, you know, four to 10 years of experience, let's say, then it might be a little bit tough sometimes to find a landing spot because there are cheaper players out there that have one, two years of experience. That's In some cases, nearly uh, $250,000 worth of savings and other cases above that. And so because of that, what the NFL did was they implemented a new rule called the vet salary benefit. So the way that this works is that a veteran can come in with, let's say, seven years of experience. And so, or actually, let's talk about this in in Drake Kirkpatrick terms, just in case the Saints do sign Drake Kirkpatrick. This also happened with Ty Montgomery this year. 
Dre's been in the NFL for nine seasons so far. So if he signed with the New Orleans Saints, he would very likely sign a veteran minimum deal of $1.075 million. The Saints could then turn around and give him a small roster bonus or bonus of any kind. It could be a signing bonus, a roster bonus, whatever. They can give him a small bonus of just over $137,000. And by doing that, what they do with the NFL now with this veteran minimum benefit is that they adjust how much the team is charged versus how much the player makes. So when you hear $1.075 million of base salary plus a $137,000 signing bonus, your immediate inclination is to put that together and say the Saints would then be paying over $1.2 million for this veteran player. But what the NFL has put in place is the vet minimum benefit, which reduces the cap hit for the team. So instead of the team paying that or being, so the team will pay the $1.075 million plus the signing bonus to the player, the player still gets that money. But in terms of what actually goes against the team's salary cap, the NFL has started to reduce the price of the base salary down to somebody with two years of experience. Remember when I said, remember the two-year $850,000 pay range? This is why. So instead of the Saints having to pay $1.2 million, they paid just over $980,000 with the $850,000 base salary and the $137.5,000 signing bonus. And I know that that's a lot of numbers and you're not supposed to use numbers when you're talking on these things, but I want you to have this information because this is really important. Not every contract hits the salary cap the way that it seems. You look at Ty Montgomery's salary cap right now, he has a base salary of $1.075 million. He has that small bonus that we just talked about. But instead of his cap hit being those two numbers combined, it is actually only $987,000, less than that of the base salary that he's actually signed for. This is really important because it, it essentially allows teams to continue to sign veteran players with NFL experience at the price of a cheaper, younger option, which keeps vets viable in the market and keeps them from pricing themselves out of teams based strictly on how long they've been in the NFL. This is a very important rule, I think, and one that a lot of teams take advantage of and has worked to the advantage of a lot of different players. DJ Swearinger, Michael Burton, Ty Montgomery, all of these players and many more were all on this vet salary benefit type of contract last year in 2020. And now you're starting to see some of those players come back, including Ty Montgomery here in 2021. And if the Saints were assigned Drake Kirkpatrick, very likely he would file as one of those guys as well. So this is a really important thing to keep tabs on because again, not all contracts are created equally. And this helps out teams like the Saints who continue to work around the sign, uh, excuse me, the salary cap and continue to sign these veteran players to bring a veteran presence, but are only paying for two years of experience. It's not a bad deal at all. So that's the way that veteran minimum contracts are decided in terms of their price and the way that vet minimum benefits both benefit not only the players, but also the teams across the NFL. Now, coming up next, we're going to get to some news, notes, and highlights from yesterday's media availability on Tuesday. We're going to talk a little Cesar Ruiz. Where has he been playing guard or center? We're going to talk a little bit about what we learned new about Zach Bond and much more as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And don't forget to go and check out our good friends over at rockauto.com. We're talking about making sure that, that you realize that like not all of these contracts are created equal. Well, not every auto part service is created equal either because Rock Auto stands above the rest. You can get the same parts that you're looking for for whatever vehicle, whatever year, whatever you've got, they've got you covered with their expansive catalog of options. And you're going to be able to get those parts, pieces, or accessories at a fraction of the prices which you're going to get them for over at the chain stores around the corner who are going to waste 20 minutes of your time to tell you, hey, we actually don't have the part right now that I just told you that we had, but we can order it for you and get it here for you in about two to three weeks. No, you don't have to worry about any of that. You can get what you need right away from the comfort of your own home over at rockauto.com. So go and check them out. Let them know what your make, model, and year of your vehicle are. And then of course, what it is that you're looking for, and they'll get you all taken care of and you'll have it shipped directly to your door safely. So go and check them out, rockauto.com. Don't forget to let them know that Locked On sent you by writing Locked On in the How'd You Hear About Us section just under the shipping information at checkout. It's rockauto.com. Amazing selection, reliable low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need. Let's get it. Who that Nation wrapping up today's episode of Locked On Saints with a little bit of an update to the Marshawn Lattimore contract. So Field Yates just tweeted out as I was recording this that 
The contract for Marshawn Lattimore, for cornerback Marshawn Lattimore, the Saints added four voidable years worth $120 million. Now I'm going to tell you why both of those numbers are important. Both those numbers are important because if they added four voidable years, then it is indeed a max extension or, or excuse me, a max restructure, meaning that the Saints did shave off that amount of money that we talked about in the first segment of $7.4 million. Good news for the New Orleans Saints. The second number, $120 million, is also very important. That $30 million per year ghost extension essentially does mean something. Basically, what happens is that Marshawn Lattimore hits free agency in March of next year, about nine months away. The new CBA has something, has a clause written into it that if you renegotiate a player's contract within 12 months of the uh, of, of two negotiations, essentially, that you can't renegotiate the salary higher than what was originally put on paper. So because of the fact that the Saints listed this as a $30 million per year void year extension, remember it's void year, so right now this money doesn't actually exist, it does keep the Saints from accidentally capping how much Marshawn Lattimore can make. Let's say that they were to add four years to this contract and give him, let's say, $40 million total of fake money during that time. That's only $10 million per year. If they try to renegotiate and extend him into future years in within the next 12 months, which they would have to in order to keep him from hitting free agency, they wouldn't be able to go higher than that. That would put Marshawn Lattimore in a really tricky situation because, and the Saints in a really tricky situation, because essentially they would have just capped how much they can actually give. Marshawn Lattimore in an extension with this $30 million per year, right? It's all fictitious at the moment. But with this $30 million per year, quote unquote, extension there with the voidable years, it gives them the opportunity to negotiate down from that as opposed to being limited in terms of how high they can go. This is a really smart move by New Orleans and shows Marshawn Lattimore that there is indeed interest in making sure that the at least mechanisms are there to keep him long term. You'll remember that you saw the same thing done with Taysom Hill's contract, which made everyone go nuts on Twitter. He was given a $140 million contract when he wasn't really. They were just making sure that the numbers were high on that in case they wanted to extend him after this season based upon whether or not he becomes their starting quarterback. They did the exact same thing for Teron Armstead's restructure, and they did the exact same thing for Jameis Winston's restructure as well. So those restructures are making sure that the door is still open for extensions for all four of those players and beyond, because they've done it with other players as well. Moving forward, an important thing to keep in mind here about the relationship between the team and the players, and specifically with Marshawn Lattimore's situation uh, at the forefront of the mind as well in terms of whether or not he's going to get his extension with the team. They're keeping the door open to make sure that they can do so and do right by him in the meanwhile. Let's move on to some of our big news and notes from media availability on Tuesday. So first of all, uh, I'm able to be in media availability now, so I'm able to ask questions and everything. And I got the great opportunity to speak with a couple of defensive players in yesterday's uh, in yesterday's media availability. And one of the things that came up was around Zach Bond, linebacker, who, of course, was drafted as a pass rusher out of Wisconsin or was a pass rusher at Wisconsin. But they've always sort of talked about, the Saints did, moving him to an off-ball linebacker position. We got a little bit more clarification on that yesterday when Zach Bond was asked by Nick Underhill a bit more about what he was doing over the course of the offseason. I mentioned specifically that he was working at Will Linebacker, so weak side linebacker. So that's going to be really interesting to see how all of that works out because that has been Demario Davis's role in the past, but then that has also been Quan Alexander's role in some cases. So we'll see how the linebacker shuffle continues. But it does mean that Zach Bond should be firmly entrenched in potentially fighting for a spot if Demario Davis plays at the Mike or the middle linebacker position, and then Zach Bond and Pete Werner would be sort of in competition for the weak side linebacker role in that case. Otherwise, if Demario Davis continues to play weak side and Pete Werner plays in the middle or Mike, remember they play a lot of nickels. So there's only two uh, linebackers on the field at the time, so hard to say middle in that situation. But the role of a Mike linebacker, which would allow Demario Davis to operate more in space and in coverage and blitz and all these things that he likes to do and that he does so well, all of that would then open up the opportunity for Zach Bond to immediately back up uh, Demario Davis. But we are starting to finally see a surefire transition for Zach Bond, at least put in the surefire terms, from pass rusher to off-ball linebacker, which I think is a good move for him at this level of the game. Speaking of clarity on positions, we did get an early look at one of the biggest off-season questions this year for the New Orleans Saints. Where will Cesar Ruiz play and what's going to happen with the Saints offensive line? Are we going to see Cesar Ruiz play where he was essentially drafted to play, which is center? 
and then them move Eric McCoy to right guard, or will Cesar Ruiz play where he played last season at right guard with a truncated offseason and not really a lot of opportunity for him to get to work in at the center spot in 2020? It looks like guard is the spot for Cesar Ruiz. And now we started to sort of feel this way over the last little bit, especially after hearing Zach Streve talk at the golf open for the St. Hall of Fame and hearing some other comments that were made by the coaches. We kind of saw this on the way. Now we get a little bit more clarification to it with Cesar Ruiz, not only saying that he's been playing guard over the course of offseason, but that his focus is getting better at the guard position moving forward. So it seems that that's going to be where he's locked in and we can continue to expect Eric McCoy at center barring anything strange happening, this seems to be what the lineup is going to be. And honestly, as much as I sort of, you know, touted the line here for Cesar Ruiz to be the starting center for the Saints last year, I or excuse me, next year, I do get this. This does make sense. You're reinvesting into Cesar Ruiz who put an entire season into playing the cent- the guard position without shaking up the center position at all because Moving Cesar Ruiz to center doesn't just solve your problem. You then also have to make sure that Eric McCoy is going to be able to perform fine at guard, which is a spot that he didn't play very much in college, just like Cesar Ruiz. So this seems to be the most comfortable situation for both players as they continue to move forward into the offseason. Now, finally, to wrap up today, I want to talk a little bit about some comments that were made about Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill. Basically, Taysom Hill had mentioned that he does believe that the timing of a starting quarterback being named is important because it allows you to tailor the offense to that quarterback. But Sean Payton mentioned that there will be some differences between the Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill led offenses regarding, you know, depending upon who wins. But regardless of who actually wins that starting competition, a lot of the same core philosophies will be in place. And that makes a lot of sense. This isn't just going to be Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill's offense. It's also Sean Payton's offense. And Sean Payton has philosophies that are very important to the way that the that that you know achieves team success for this organization. They like to mitigate the turnovers. They get the ball out quickly to alleviate pressure on the quarterback. They take safer throws over bigger risks. They utilize the running back out of the backfield. They spread the ball around. All of these things are main tenets to the New Orleans Saints offense. And they're not going to go anywhere just because Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill is under center. That's going to remain. What's going to be different is maybe you see more downfield shots with Jameis Winston. Maybe you see more design runs for Taysom Hill. So there will be specificity in terms of what each of these offenses looks like in terms of the tools that each of these quarterbacks bring. But the main tenets and philosophies will remain the same in terms of this being an offense that sets up the big play with the conservatism that they'll use in the foreground. And then, of course, utilizing the run game with Alvin Kamara and for now Latavius Murray as well. All right, y'all, we get more media availability today. So we'll be talking more about what some players had to say in tomorrow's episode on Thursday. And of course, it's top three Thursday. So for that, we'll take a look at some top three moments that I'm looking forward to in the 2021 NFL seasons. We'll talk about that and much more and continue to keep you up to date with everything that you've got going on with your New Orleans Saints. Don't forget to check out Locked on Pelicans, Locked on LSU. Check out the Locked on Today podcast as well for all of the news that you need around the sports world in less than 20 minutes. We'll be back with you tomorrow. And as always, I thank you very much for all you do in supporting the show, for coming through, for watching, for subscribing, listening, commenting, everything that you do. I appreciate it so much. You can find me on Twitter anytime at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them and trust you that nation. I'll holla at you.